All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here for the Unit 4 hearing of the National Invitational. My name is Ryan Susky. I'm Director of Programs at the Ohio Center for Law-Related Education, and I'll be your facilitator today. In just a moment, I'm going to have the judges introduce themselves, followed, of course, by the students, and then we'll begin the hearing. Students are going to be delivering a four-minute prepared statement, followed by eight minutes of judge questions. My microphone will be muted during the hearing, but I will be holding up the uh, one minute and time signs. For that reason, I do suggest that you use the gallery view rather than speaker view so that you can see my time signals, your fellow students, and of course the judges. At the conclusion of the hearing, the judges will give brief feedback to the teams, and then we will conclude. With that, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to your chairperson to begin the introductions. Thank you. Uh, congratulations, Joseph T. Uh, Henley Middle School um, on making it to the National Invitational. Um, we're really excited to be here. My name is Diana Owen. I'm a professor of political science at Georgetown University. Good morning. Uh, well, good afternoon now. Uh, I'm Deshaun Whitaker. I'm a Lead the People teacher in Charles County Public Schools in Maryland. Hi, and my name is uh, Joe Stewart, and I teach in the political science department at Clemson University in South Carolina. Relax. We're going to learn from you, have some fun uh, talking about the Constitution today. And now if you would please introduce yourselves and your teacher. Hi, uh, I'm Dan Diamond from Unit 4, and I'm super excited to be here. Hi, I'm Cindy Adams, and I'm also very excited to be here. Hi, I'm Claire Key. I'm really excited to be here. And our um, incredible teachers are Miss Curry and Miss Beauchene. Okay, great. Great, thanks so much. And, and thank you to your teachers for, for bringing you here. Uh, so the question for today is question one. An American historian claims that the ratification debates were quote, one of the greatest and most probing public debates in American history, unquote. Do you agree or disagree? Why? What evidence can you offer to support your response? Evaluate the major arguments the Federalists advanced in support of the ratification <clears throat> of the Constitution. Evaluate the major arguments the anti federalists put forth in opposition to ratification of the Constitution. Why did a Bill of Rights become a focal point for both the Federalist and the anti federalist Please begin. The ratification debates were the greatest and most important debates in U.S. history because they were a national conversation in which the agreement centered on persuasion and reasonable negotiation regarding the development of our country through words, not force. The Articles of Confederation were important to ratify because the national government needed to have more control and power than the state government. The Constitution needed to be ratified by nine of the 13 states, and they knew it was going to be a challenge. Federalists and supporters of the Constitution, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay, anonymously wrote the Federalist Papers for the New York newspaper, urging others to join them. But the Anti-Federalists did not like the idea of the Constitution. They were afraid that a Constitution would lead to a dangerously powerful government. An Anti-Federalist and anonymous author named Brutus worried that with lim without limitations, the state government would be dependent on the will and general government for their existence. Anti-Federalists like Patrick Henry and George Mason debated the Federalists for 10 months. The Anti-Federalists also objected to the federal court system. After 10 months of debate, they came to a compromise to ratify the Constitution with a Bill of Rights that would secure rights to citizens and allow us the freedoms that the U.S. was founded on. In 1787, public opinion about the Constitution was almost evenly divided. Federalists wanted the Constitution because it, prom it promoted better communication between the states and they thought that a central government would protect each citizen's individual rights and freedoms. However, Anti-Federalists opposed the Constitution due to the fact that they felt the central government would overlook the rights of the citizens. Eventually, the Federalists won and the Constitution was ratified. The Federalists would not have won had it not been for the Federalist Papers, more specifically Papers 70 and 78, which successfully convinced many citizens to vote in favor of the new Constitution. Federalist 70 stated that an executive branch was necessary because it prompted better decision making as well as more activity and dispatch. Federalist Paper 78 argued that a judiciary was necessary due to the fact that a branch was needed to decide if Congress's act was constitutional and also be able to settle disputes within the country. The Anti-Federalist thought that the new, the new Constitution threatened the liberties of individual citizens because the powerful federal government is too unattached from each individual's needs. In one of the Anti-Federalist papers written by George Clinton, Robert Yates, and Stanley O'Brien, they write, all human authority, however organized, must have confined limits. Some of their more specific concerns were the president's unlimited pardons, the national courts restricting the state courts, and the checks and balances. They said in reference to Congress under the new Constitution, 
it will receive no check from their constituents. These were valid concerns, as too much power of a federal government can become less of a democracy, but the current Articles of Confederation were giving too much power to the states, so things definitely needed to change. The Constitution was a way for this change to come about. Not only were the anti-federalists concerned about the, the new Constitution giving too much power, but they were also concerned about a lack of Bill of Rights. People shared this concern, leading to its ratification. The Bill of Rights became a focal point for the debate be between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists because they disagreed on whether or not it should be included in the Constitution. The Federalists believed that a Bill of Rights created a so-called parchment barrier and limited the rights of the people rather than protecting them, and claiming in Federalist 84, which was written by Alexander Hamilton, that they were redundant. For why declare things shall not be done which there is no power to do? The anti federalists wanted a Bill of Rights to be included in the Constitution because otherwise they feared that the people of America would be oppressed. They believed that some rights were so fundamental to a free society that they had to be clearly defined and protected in a Bill of Rights in order to prevent those rights from being infringed. In the end, the Federalists and the anti federalists reached an agreement with the Massachusetts Compromise and decided to add a Bill of Rights in the Finnish Constitution. Eventually, all states agreed and the Constitution was ratified. Thanks very much for your statement. I enjoyed that. And uh, now you'll uh, be getting some questions from uh, the judges. Um, you mentioned in your opening statement that the Bill of Rights protects fundamental rights. Can you talk a little bit about what exactly those fundamental rights are? So the Bill of Rights have, has 10 amendments. And one of the, I think the most fundamental rights is the freedom of speech. And although the, um, the people who wrote the Constitution definitely had good intentions when they were um, putting in our rights to freedom of speech and freedom of religion and other assorted rights, um, they didn't know that society was to progress and then eventually things would be invented like social media and technology, all of which um, changed how the freedom of speech has been interpreted. For example, on, um, for example, on social media, technically it is a private company. So if you create an account or post something on social media, you have to agree to the terms and conditions of whatever provider presented to you when you created that account. But a lot of people have been arguing disinformation, um, hate speech, that is technically freedom of speech. And that has definitely affected a lot of what we consider freedom of speech today. Yeah, I mean, bouncing off of what Claire said, it is so fundamental that every US citizen uses what they, um, uses their rights that are listed within the Bill of Rights. However, um, Although I think the constitution being a living document is a massive pro, some of the cons is that as society progresses, certain things may become outdated or seem out of order. Uh, for an example, I do believe every citizen should have the right to bear arms, but the founders couldn't have possibly known how um, technology would progress as time goes on because guns were so um, different uh, way back then. And the same thing as Claire said with, with uh, social media, where do you draw the line between, you know, intruding on someone's right to free speech and then following online rules. And without the compromise between the anti-federalists and the federalists, we wouldn't have a Bill of Rights, which comes into play every day through trial by jury, freedom of speech, freedom to assemble, freedom of religion. And I just think without that um, compromise, we would be in a very different place today. All right, thank you. Um, you mentioned about the Constitution could become outdated and out of order. Our Constitution has been amended 27 times throughout history. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you feel that those amendments were sufficient or do we need to take it a step further now because our society has changed? You go, Claire. <laughs> Okay, um, I definitely think that our current process of amending the Constitution is too difficult. Um, it is a citizen's right. It is their civic duty to amend the Constitution when they see that something is wrong and it infringes on other people's rights. And for example, having to pay legal fees to take the case all the way to the Supreme Court and to get the Constitution amended is too difficult of a process, in my opinion. Um, my teammates are free to disagree with me, but I think it should be made easier to amend the constitution, but not too easy because we can't have um, amendments coming in left and right and constantly changing the constitution. And I'm, I'm certain because the constitution is a really great baseline, but I don't think it should be taken 
um, as if every single thing it says is concrete because as Dan and Sadie both said, time goes on, things change. And um, a lot of things might become outdated as time goes on. But I think definitely the constitution is a great baseline. It is a living document, so it can be amended. But I think the process of amending the constitution is a little bit too difficult. I mean, the opening line, lines of the, of the constitution are, we the people. The people are the ones who should be in control of their own government through things like voting and other sort of matters. So the fact that it can be so hard for a person to try and get their problem fixed, because the truth is, unless you have a large sum of money, you aren't going to actually be able to take your case all the way. And unfortunately, it's those who have a lot of money who are actually benefiting off of certain things. And those who don't have the money are the ones that really need change. Fortunately, for really extremely important matters that are restricting or just blatantly racist, um, matters have gone all the way, such as to completely outlaw this discrimination and uh, legalizing same-sex marriage in every single state. Okay, but you, you talk about the importance of having the people involved. If we look at the, uh, if we look at the time surrounding the, the Constitutional Convention and ratification, how broadly we, did we define we the people? Uh, and how does that compare to where we are today? Well, the people do actually have the right to congregate and try and um, draft um, new items that they want to go all the way and try and make change in, within the, their country. But there have been thousands of attempts to amend the Constitution, and um, only a few of those have actually gotten through all the way. And when those politicians um, came together to try and amend the Constitution, they were all pretty much the the same people, more or less. You know, they were all, quite frankly, wealthy white men. There was no representation. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important for the uh, Constitution to be a living document. As time goes on, we get more opportunities to try and branch out and add more important things. Um, it's an, a, another reason why maybe judges shouldn't have, you know, um, their term be for life. Maybe every you know decade or so we vote new ones in because right now only the president has the power to assign new supreme court judges when i think it should be the people since it's really their country you've talked about the constitution as a living document primarily through the amendment process are there other ways that the constitution is a living document well in other ways the constitution is a living document because it's up to the judiciary to interpret the Constitution in ways that are relevant to time as time goes on. And that goes into judicial review. Um, in this case, when a law is brought up that contravenes the Constitution, um, the Supreme Court and the um, judicial branch has the power to strike down those laws. And so in a way, the Constitution is interpreted differently as time goes on in order for it to become relevant with the judiciary and um, the judicial branch in general. The judiciary branch, like there are thousands of cases brought um, on the constitution and they have to decide based on the original meaning of the document and their moral reasoning and how society has progressed uh, about how to interpret the document. Oh, okay. So I'll try to squeeze in this question as quickly as I can. Um, how do you feel about, do you feel that Congress accurately represents the voice of the people. Personally, I do feel that Congress accurately represents the voice of the people because um, people are voted in and um, the representatives in Congress, the senators, um, the people who are part of the House of Representatives, they are all elected by the people. And although I sh do acknowledge that, you know, running a campaign to become a senator or to become a representative is something that is expensive and people who aren't so privileged with money or having the resources to run a presidential campaign um, might not even have the chance to run. Um, I do feel that that is a little bit limiting, but I think that um, as a country, the United States has made great advances when it comes to um, representation in Congress. Um, we see many people of color, women, um, mm -hmm. they're all elected to Congress. And I think that is definitely a great step forward to of having a representation, accurate representation of the United States in um, Congress. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, now's the time that uh, the judges will give you some feedback. Uh, I just want to start off by saying that uh, you did a really superb job on your opening statement. I like the way that you framed it from the outset as a national conversation and kind of gave us the sense that that national conversation ha has continued through history and is still something that's um, happening today. Uh, the way that your uh, opening statement unfolded is like you were telling the story uh, where I could feel the, the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist, you know, kind of debating uh, the different issues as uh, they arose. And you were did a great job of talking about what the key issues were, um, the key debates, and ultimately the compromises that um, led to the ratification of uh, the Constitution. Um, you brought up some very sophisticated terms and arguments, like the idea of a parchment barrier, um, and um, the idea of the Constitution as a living document. I um, particularly liked the way that you um, related the Constitution um, and you know, kind of its, its relevance today um, to specific uh, examples, such as you know, kind of social media and getting really into how you know our society has changed. I also like the idea of you know the Second Amendment that um, guns are different now than at the time of the founders. So, you know, kind of interpreting uh, the Second Amendment strictly might, you know, not be as relevant uh, today as it could have been at the time that the founders um, kind of d d devised the amendment. Um, I really like the fact that you talked about uh, amending the Constitution as something that's not easily done and then expressed your opinion about whether you think that, you know, it's, this is kind of a, a good or a bad thing. Um, and I, your awareness of, you know, kind of the, you know, societal uh, stratification and, and the fact that people with more resources, particularly more economic resources, are able to kind of get a leg up uh, in terms of how they're able to, you know, if they wanted to do something um, to maybe change the constitution or run for office or whatever, that they do have uh, a benefit. So that awareness of what's, um, you know, kind of the realities of our society and the inequities, um, I, I think was really great. So your your presentation, I thought was first rate in terms of outlining the issues relating to specifics. And I also felt that the answers to uh, the follow-up questions were quite sophisticated and showed a depth of knowledge, even bringing in things like judicial review and other things. So great job. Thank you. Yes, I agree with my colleague. Um, I enjoyed hearing your thoughts on everything. Um, I wish we could have talked a little bit more about the amendment process and how you feel people should be involved in the amendment process, but we ran out of time for that. But you all did a superb job today and I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with my colleagues. And, and one way had we had time uh, to, to kind of separate out, I, it, it struck me that you kind of blended the formal amendment process with the way the Constitution is a living document. And that would have been a way, I think, of adding some clarity uh, to, to the positions that you took. Um, I like the, the fact that you talked about that the Federalists knew it would be a challenge and that public opinion was divided on this. Uh, I would have liked to explore it some more. You, you give the Federalist Papers a, a strong position in terms of winning this, but note that it's, it's targeted toward New York. And, and so in fact, a number of the states had already made their decisions uh, on, on uh, ratification uh, by the time the Federalist Papers were were published and, and they're published in sequence. I, I have argued that one of the worst things that's ever happened is that we pulled all the Federalist Papers together and bound them into one volume. And so people tend to think of them as something that came out all at once and uh, in, in one group. But I thought you had that sense that these were political documents. Um, You've also mastered some of the skills of civic discourse too. You, you talked about the valid concerns of, of the different sides. So all in all, uh, I, I agree with my colleague, a very sophisticated discussion. 
and I very much enjoyed having this discussion with you. Thank you. And thanks Thank you so much for having you so well prepared. Yes, congratulations to all of you and congratulations to your teacher. You did a, a great job in, in getting your team ready for this competition.